Recording in progress. All right, well, welcome everybody to CC Colloquium. It is really cool to have, I don't know, there's 30 people or so here in the room and there's what, 50 or so online. Um, so welcome to the first uh, science-focused CC Colloquium of the season. As you uh, can see, we have a great lineup for the semester, a lot of um, diverse faces, diverse science. Um, next week is going to be actually in person here. Laura Kerber is going to visit us in person. So that's going to be our first in-person colloquium in way too long. So um, we hope that many of you will be able to, to also come in person to join. Um, so with that, I am going to turn this over to Professor Bell to hey. introduce our distinguished speaker. Thanks, Earl. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, sorry about the delay. I had a last minute internet crisis, uh, blah, 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 modern world. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, it's great to, uh, to have our, our speaker here kicking off the colloquium series. Uh, this, uh, this semester, uh, Bruce Bannert is uh, the principal investigator, the PI of the uh, INSIGHT mission uh, as a geophysicist at, uh, at JPL, uh, Jet Propulsion Lab in, in Pasadena. Uh, as uh, as uh, some of you have saw his, uh, his detailed bio that we, we sent around, uh, BS in physics, PS, PhD in geophysics uh, from USC. Uh, and he's been at JPL since 1977. Uh, Bruce, I, I think we've served on some committees and panels together, uh, and he's, he's done an enormous number of service activities for the community. He was, uh, will probably tell us some of this story, but has been trying to get seismometers on Mars for a long time and has succeeded uh, spectacularly along with his team, as you will see and, and hear about today. He's uh, one of these uh, planetary scientists that studies planetary interiors, gravity, magnetic, topographic, seismic data. Um, and uh, I, I think it's just been uh, ab absolutely delightful to see the success of Insight. Uh, Bruce, uh, Bruce and I, were, we worked together. Actually, you were the project scientist uh, for part of the time for Spirit and Opportunity uh, back, uh, back in the Mars Exploration Rover mission. So was involved with uh, those surface exploration missions as well. Um, so uh, I've just been, uh, it's been delightful to see these uh, incredible and in many ways surprising results coming out of Insight. We're going to hear a lot about that today. Uh, Bruce, thank you so much for agreeing to, uh, to come and talk with us. And I know you're going to get some, uh, a rapt audience and you're going to get some great questions that come out of this. So turn it over to you. Thank you again. Okay, Jim. Yeah, great. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I'm talking about my favorite subject, which is insight, has been kind of an obsession with me for, um, well, the seismometers on Mars have been an obsession for at least 25 or 30 years. Um, and finally, it looks like uh, we've got the results. And I'm trying to figure, I'm trying to talk and share at the same time, which is uh, a challenge for me. Let's see, that's a desktop. Let's see if I can find PowerPoint in this. Here we go. There's PowerPoint, hit share, and then full screen it there. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about um, the inside of Mars with as much alliteration as I could come up with. Um, so starting off with the Insight mission objective. So the, the, the goal is actually pretty simple for Insight. You know, we wanted to, to be able to, to constrain, to, to understand better the formation and early evolution processes of terrestrial planets by studying the internal structure of Mars. And I'll talk a little bit about why we thought that was a good idea. Uh, and, and we we had to, since we were in a, in a, a proposal, this was a, a competitively selected mission, we had to actually sell this stuff, this thing pretty pretty hard. So what we did is we, we focused in on six things that we thought we would be able to measure. Uh, the thickness of the crust and its layering, um, the structure of the upper mantle, the size and density of the core, uh, the heat flux of the mantle, the rate and distribution of seismic activity, and the rate of meteorite impacts. And those are the three things. I'm going to, only going to talk about the first three of these today, um, which is really the, uh, the, 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 the core of our mission, the scientific core of our, our mission. And if I talked about everything, I'd be here all afternoon. So a um, little bit of background. So I, I, I like to talk about insight as being uh, like a time machine. So uh, first of all, you know, it's, it's traveling back about, oh, 125, 130 years back to the sort of the turn of the, 
of the, the 20th century, uh, when geophysicists were first starting to ask questions and, and, and starting to get answers about the basic structure of the interior of the Earth. Um, before that, it was mostly just theoretical. Not really much was known. Um, but they're asking the same questions that, uh, that, that, that Insight's asking. You know, what's the thickness of the crust? What's the mantle look like? Uh, how big is the, the corn? What's it made out of? Um, and, and the distribution of seismicity, heat flow, all these things were being asked about the Earth uh, around, oh, around 1900. So a little, little bit of history. So the very first remote detection of an earthquake was in, in, um, in 1889 uh, by Ernst von Rebler Paschwitz. And, and he actually was looking at the, um, the uh, uh, perturbations of gravity by the moon and got this weird wiggle on his, his, uh, his, uh, um, on his record. And uh, a couple of months later, he was reading the newspaper about uh, an earthquake in Tokyo that happened. And he realized it happened um, within tens of minutes of when he got this signal and, and put two and two together and uh, uh, published the fact that he'd actually detected an earthquake from almost all the way across the planet. Uh, and, and I think the, maybe the most startling thing about this whole story is this facial hair that he's got with that mustache sticking out it that that always that always blows me away but anyway hopefully you've got the resolution to, to, to see that um uh go forward about 15 years and by then um there's enough uh, detections enough observations of earthquakes and, and and their distances to start putting together um uh time distance plots and, and this is a, a time distance plot that showed evidence of a big discontinuity. You see over there on the right, there's a big jump in those dots. Um, and that jump was interpreted by uh, Richard Oldham as, um, the, as the, the effect of the core. This was uh, uh, an effect on the waves in the core because the waves go through iron at different speed than they do through rock. And he was able to actually detect directly the core and get the size of the core from, from seismology. Just a few, few years later, uh, Andrea Mohorovicic was able to use seismology to figure out the thickness of the crust beneath Croatia uh, by using uh, an earthquake in, in Central Europe and seeing the, the bounce of that earthquake off the, the bottom of the crust back up to a seismometer, uh, timing that, uh, that, the, the, that wave. And by knowing uh, pretty fairly well the, the, the speed of waves in rocks, was able to get the, the thickness of the crust of the Earth for the first time. Um, and again, both these guys uh, sort of are, are keeping the, the uh, uh, tradition of uh, massive facial hair in, 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 in seismology. Um, that tradition was broken in, in 36 by Inga Lehman, who uh, was able to actually uh, detect the inner core of the earth. The, the outer core, of course, is, is liquid and there's a solid inner core. And she was able to analyze seismic records and see the effect of an inner core, reflections off of that inner core. Um, probably largely because she was a woman, this wasn't even really widely accepted until uh, almost 10 years later when um, more data was available. It was kind of dismissed, but uh, it was eventually um, shown to be uh, a, a, a really uh, careful and, and uh, uh, kind of an amazingly uh, detailed analysis of the seismic records to get the, the inner core. And then, you know, within another five years, uh, Gutenberg and Richter published uh, a, a, a kind of a, a massive tome which pulled together um, uh, hundreds and hundreds of seismic records and, and hundreds of locations of, of earthquakes and started to find the distribution of earthquakes around the Earth, the so-called seismicity of the Earth. And um, they found that they occurred in these, these bands, uh, mostly beneath the oceans, but coming up into continents and eventually um, you know, within another 20 years, um, this was uh, was considered, you know, one of the, the, the foundations of, uh, of uh, the theory of plate tectonics. And so, you know, within about a 50 year time span, geophysicists went from the very first detection of an earthquake to really the basic understanding of the planet Earth uh, as we know it today. And we've put a lot of detail on it since then, but all the basic building blocks 
have been put in place within a, a span of about 50 years. Um, with Insight, we had enough chutzpah that we figured we could do this in two years. So, um, and it turns out that uh, it, it, that we, we were able to do it. Um, thank goodness, because I, I, I really promised NASA that we could, uh, and they gave me a, more than a half a billion dollars to do it. So, um, good to, good bet, guys. So, after two years of data, we we're actually ready to start answering these these big questions. So this is the um, structure of the Earth, Mars, and the Moon, uh, the comparison of them uh, from the Encyclopedia of the Solar System uh, in, in 2014. So uh, what, seven years ago. And you can see, you know, we have uh, the, the core, the mantle, the crust. There's some uh, uh, divisions in the upper mantle at 400, 600 kilometers on the Earth. Um, we actually know the same kinds of things for the Moon. We know it has a crust, we have a, a mantle and a, and a core, um, and we know the, the, the sizes and, and thicknesses of all these different um, layers and, and regions in those two planets. But if you look at Mars, all we have are question marks, okay? We don't know, we have guesses as to what the, 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 the crust is, and these are based on some, some chemical arguments and a little bit of gravity. Um, the core, we kind of have a, a trade-off between density and radius from uh, the precession of, of, of Mars, but really there's a big uncertainty. You know, there's, there's you know, 600 kilometers of, of uh, uncertainty basically in, in, in the size of the, of the core. And we don't really know that where the um, uh, uh, transition zones in the mantle. And these are, these are depths at which uh, um, the, the, the dense uh, rocks in the mantle uh, change their change their um, crystal uh, 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 construction to, to go to, to higher higher density phases, and that depends on things like temperature, pressure, and the uh, the detailed chemistry of, of the material. And so, all this stuff was unknown for Mars um, seven years ago. All question marks. So. Um, we would love to know just what Mars looks like, just out of curiosity, but you know. Just idle curiosity really isn't enough to sell, you know, a, a, a five to five hundred to eight hundred billion million dollar mission to, to NASA. So we actually were able to tie this. We tie this to bigger picture questions. We we really want to understand um, what was happening, you know, four and a half billion years ago at the very birth of our solar system. And so, insights like a, a time machine, an e even better time machine than just a hundred years, goes back four and a half billion years. And the uses Mars to understand what happened in the first few tens to maybe 100 million years of uh, the formation of Mars, and by analogy, what happens, uh, what happened to to the Earth at the same time, understanding how the Earth came to be what the way it is today, and and, and trying to understand how it became a, a habitable planet um, in, in contrast to uh, Mars or Venus or, or a lot of the exoplanets that we see. So, um, and we do that by looking at the, the processes of terrestrial planet formation. Um, so we know that a planet starts to form by accretion, by the clumping together of meteoritic material, sort of uh, the, the dust that was going around the sun that is uh, of a composition similar to carbonaceous chondrites or a certain class of carbonaceous chondrites. Starts clumping together as it gets the larger and larger clumps the interior of these uh, sort of protoplanets start to heat up and, and melt. And they heat up both from uh, the energy of the impact of different uh, chunks of material together, and also from radioactive material that's, that's uh, uh, sort of part of that, of that material. So as it gets bigger, it gets hotter, it heats up, things start to, to melt, magic happens, and you end up with a planet with a crust, mantle, and core which is really kind of uh, amazing when you think about it, because you start off with this kind of brownish gray material, which is what a meteorite looks like uh, in, in space. And you end up with a planet which is made up of all different kinds of rocks, none of which look very much like a meteorite. And so, you know, how does that happen? Um, it's pretty much, looks like magic because we don't really understand it very well. But what we're hoping is to use insight to turn magic into science and that's that's what scientists try to do they try to turn magic into science if anybody ever asks you what a scientist does so what's this process of differentiation 
uh, that we're trying to understand the, the process by which we go from a homogeneous uh, mass of, of one kind of rock to a layered uh, planet with different kinds of rock. And it's done by differentiation. You melt rocks and the different components of the rock, the different molecules uh, basically separate and be become, become different layers. So you start off first, the, um, the, the metals uh, start to coagulate into droplets. They're much heavier than the uh, uh, rock, the molten rock there within. They fall down to, to form the core. Um, then as you cool down more, you start to get the condensation or, or the um, crystallization rather of the uh, higher temperature minerals. Um, those tend to be heavy and they sink uh, to the bottom and different minerals will crystallize at different temperatures, different pressures. You go on and on the moon at least you get something that starts, the uh, end stuff starts to float to the top and make a crust and you end up with a, a layered planet. And this is a really complex process. Uh, as I said, it depends on things like the temperature and pressure. Um, and after things crystallize, sometimes as it gets cooler, they actually remelt again and turn into something else. And it depends on whether things are turbulent and get remixed or whether they get sort of sequestered in these, these layers. And we really wanna be able to understand this process and sort of the fingerprints of this process are gonna be frozen into the planet. Okay, and, that, and that's what the, 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 the sort of our working hypothesis is that the crust of Mars, the mantle of Mars, retains the fingerprints of this very early process. Okay, well, well, why go to Mars to do this? Why not just look at the Earth? Um, well, it turns out that much of the Earth's early structural evidence has been destroyed. Um, we've got plate tectonics that is uh, forming new crust all the time of the older crust is being sucked back down into the mantle of subduction zones. And so you don't really have that crust that formed uh, early on in, in, in Earth's history. Plus the, there's enough heat coming out of the Earth that you have sort of vigorous convection going on the mantle. Things are getting mixed up. And so you really don't have uh, this information left over uh, from, from early in the solar system. The moon would be a, a great place to, to study this. It's small, it's simple. Uh, but unfortunately, the pressure and temperature conditions that, that the moon formed under are really limited. If you go down to the core of the moon, the very center of the moon, um, the pressure and temperature is about the same as maybe 125 miles deep in the Earth. And so you have this huge uh, region of the Earth that's really not, um, not been, been uh, experienced by the moon. So Mars is large enough, this has uh, most of the processes that went on in the Earth, but it's small enough to have retained the evidence of this early activity. And there's lots of evidence uh, that that's true, that there hasn't been a lot of, uh, of uh, change since early in Mars's history. And so Mars is, we go to Mars because it's not too big, it's not too small, it's just right. Okay, so that's all the fun stuff. From here on, it gets hard because it turns out that if you want to look at something that's, uh, under thousands of kilometers of rock uh, by measuring things that are small, as small as an atom uh, in the dirt on another planet, it turns out to be a lot harder than it sounds. And so the way we've done this is with uh, uh, just a few instruments. Uh, the seismometer, which is uh, size is over there on the left in this view. Um, it's underneath a, 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 sh a shell that's protecting it from the, the wind and the weather, a little bit at least. Um, we also track the, uh, the spacecraft with precision tracking. We had a heat flow probe that unfortunately didn't work. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about that because that will just make me cry. Um, but we do have a lot of other stuff that's supporting that. It turns out that uh, a seismometer measures uh, the, the uh, displacement, measures the motion of the ground, but it's so sensitive it measures almost everything else in its uh, environment as well. And so what we have to do is we have to measure things like pressure variations. We have to measure the wind. Uh, we have to measure the magnetic field. Um, we have to measure the, the temperature very precisely. And so we have lots of instruments on InSight that were not put there as primary science instruments, but were put there to support the seismometer, but they actually give us a lot of science in addition. So this is what um, this is sort of the bread and butter of the seismologists on the mission. And this is what's, what's called a spectrogram. And I'll talk a little bit about this so you understand it. So um, running from, from uh, left to right across this image, it's, it's time. So we go from midnight over there on the left 
uh, through noon at the begin at the middle of the, uh, the figure all the way to midnight again at the very end. So this is uh, one day of, of data. Um, and from bottom to top, you, you, what you have is a slice of the frequency spectrum. So um, the very longest waves, things that are maybe almost a minute long to go from, from up and down, uh, those are at the very bottom. Uh, the black line across the middle is uh, uh, one cycle per second. So those are waves that are going about this, this, this uh, fast, which are the things that knock, knock down your house if you live in California at the wrong place at the wrong time. And then it goes all the way up to the top of this. This is about uh, 10 cycles per second. So that's, that's moving pretty fast. And so the, the color here is a measure of the size of that motion. So um, the, the, the cool colors, the purples, the, the, the blues, those are very small motions. And the, the uh, oranges and yellows, those are larger motions. Um, the, if you look at that uh, scale down there at the bottom right, that, that gives the scale. And the amplitude is given by that equation, which is about 10 to the PSD, as, uh, power spectral density, which is uh, what those numbers are, divided by 20. And if you see the bottom, that minus 200 gives you uh, an amplitude of 10 to the minus 10 meters at around one hertz, which is about the radius of a hydrogen atom. And so that's the level at which uh, this seismometer is, is, is measuring motions on, the, on, on Mars. Um, some features on this, the, the, those kind of yellow lines are resonances. They're at a single frequency all day long. They vary a little bit. And mostly those are from the, the, the lander kind of ringing. Um, that uh, B is, is, is a two and a half hertz tone that Mars has that we don't really quite understand yet, but is really interesting. And then we have the Cs and Ds. That those are our Mars quakes up there, those, those kind of smudges uh, where, where, that I have uh, ellipses around. Those are, are the Mars quakes. Those are the, what we're actually after. And then the Ds are glitches. That, those are actually thermal pops. Um, since uh, Mars is, is, is changing its temperature over a scale of 100 degrees C, which is almost 200 degrees Fahrenheit, um, the expansion and contraction of the material that the seismometer is made out of makes it pop like a like a, a cooling engine in your car, and every time it pops, it gets a big spike, and those are those are glitches, which are kind of the the, the bane of planetary seismology right now. Okay, so this is one spectrogram one day. What we oh, and, and we can actually turn this into something that looks a little bit more like you know what you might be used to if you turn it into the time domain. That uh, smudge there looks something like this, and you can see a P wave and an S wave and, and so forth. So this is a plot taking uh, one day of data and making it into a line. You just collapse that into a line, you stack all those up. And so you're going from the beginning of the seismometer operations at the top of this figure all the way till today. So that's uh, about two and a half years, two and three quarters years of data going from top to bottom. Uh, from left to right is still from, uh, from midnight through noon to midnight again. And then each of these, uh, the colors again are from uh, high, you know, pretty big uh, shaking uh, to blues, which are very low amounts of shaking. And so this is basically just a background noise uh, it, uh, plotted as a function of time of day and uh, time during the mission. But what we can do is, is actually look at this. Is there, there's, there's a pattern here. We have uh, kind of a little bit of noisy times in the early morning with, from the steady winds. In the daytime, we have very turbulent winds. It gives us a lot of noise. And then we have a very quiet time in the evening. Well, that white stripe across there is a gap in our data where the seismometer had to be shut off for about three weeks. Um, and we can superimpose on this all the Mars quakes that we've seen. So we've seen uh, about 850 Mars quakes over the last two and a half years. Uh, and you can see that they mostly occur well, they, not they mostly occur, we are mostly able to detect them in the quietest parts of the day. Um, these are very small uh, Mars quakes. Most of them are magnitude one and a half to three. Um, the largest ones we've seen up until last week were about 3.7. And there's uh, just a handful of those, maybe four or five. They're up around three and a half, 3.7 magnitude. Last week, we actually got two quakes that were up above magnitude four. And uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I can't really talk about those yet because 
We don't really know much about them yet. We're just starting to analyze them. So we have uh, quite a few Mars quakes to work with. And these Mars quakes are allowing us to see deep into the, the interior of Mars, uh, much in the way that um, a CAT scan is able to look in, inside your body at the doctor's office. So this is, uh, this is our best sort of best Mars quake to date in terms of actually looking like a quake. A lot of them are, are, are pretty small and, and, and uh, don't look very quake-like to the, to the untrained eye. But you can see there's a P wave and an S wave, you know, the compressional wave that travels the fastest and then the, the shear wave that goes a little bit slower. Um, that, that little kind of thing there, that's one of our, those glitches that's, that's from the thermal popping of, of, the, of the seismometer structure. And so we can use these signals the same way that we've used signals on the Earth to figure out you know, what's going on. And, and seismology, is, as I showed you before, is the way that we actually know most about the, the deep interior of the Earth. Um, we've been able to locate several uh, of, the, of the quakes so far. We've gotten uh, five good locations. OK, so InSight is there at the uh, Triangle in uh, Western Elysian Planitia. Um, we have four quakes that are all clustered in the same general region. And it turns out they're, they're clustered over a set of faults called Cerberus Fosse. Um, so we, we believe uh, that uh, these, these faults that we can actually see from uh, orbital images are the, the source of these Mars quakes. And we've been doing a lot of analysis to try to, to understand you know, how uh, the tectonics of Mars is, is tied into that and, and so forth. So once you have a, 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 an earthquake location, you can start doing some, some interesting things. For example, you can get the thickness of the crust. Now, we don't have any close by quakes like uh, uh, Mohorovicic did to, that will conveniently bounce up the, off the, the, the bottom of the crust for us. So we have to get, get kind of fancy. And so we, we use a lot of the principles of optics to try to, to figure out um, the thickness of the crust. Um, and we use a, a, a technique called receiver function analysis. And we use the, proce the, the um, processes of refraction and reflection, uh, understanding as you go from one layer to another with different velocities, it's gonna actually bend the, the, the waves, bend the rays of those waves in, into different directions. Plus, we have a, a, a thing that happens in seismology that doesn't happen in optics, which is you can actually change away from compression to shear. We can go from um, a wave motion that goes along the direction of the wave into something that actually goes perpendicular to the direction uh, at these boundaries. And so by putting all this together, we can actually start to, to look at the um, uh, spacing of different layers in the near surface, and we're able to put together both the thickness of the crust and figure out what any um, sort of large scale layering, we're not talking about the sedimentary layering that uh, Curiosity or um, Perseverance sees on, on Mars, we're talking about layers that are, you know, 5, 10, 15 kilometers thick, uh, sort of global scale layers that have to do with the way that the crust was put down uh, originally. So what we've been able to find is that Mars has a crust that's somewhere around 20 to 40 kilometers thick. And unfortunately, we have a still a little bit of uncertainty here um, because of there's some, some ambiguity into whether we're seeing you know, multiple bounces within that crust or whether we're seeing um, conversions of, of, uh, of uh, S waves to, to, or P waves to S waves within the crust. But um, with, a, with some more quakes, we should be able to remove that ambiguity. But we're, there's two different models that can fit the data. One's a, a two-layer model with a crust that's about 20 kilometers thick. And one's a three-layer model that has a, an, an additional layer in the crust that goes from around 20, 24 kilometers uh, down to about 37 kilometers. So um, both of these are actually uh, fairly close together compared to the uncertainty that we had before. So this is uh, this was published in Science just last month, and um, this is really the, the, the first direct uh, measurement of the thickness of the crust on Mars. Um, we looked at the, the structure of the upper mantle, and again, we have to do it the hard way because we don't have uh, triangulation. On, on the Earth, you know, we have... Uh, uh, hundreds of stations, we can look at, at, at uh, earthquake arrivals at all those stations, triangulate to get the location, 
and uh, then use that information to figure out what the velocity was from the quake to the station, use the velocity to understand the, the interior of the planet. Um, we have to get a little bit fancier. So what we do is we use what, what are called uh, uh, secondary phases. And so these are uh, not just the direct wave that goes from the source down there in the left up to the, the, the receiver, but there are other uh, wave paths where it goes down a, a little bit into the planet, comes back up, bounces off the surface, goes down again, and it can do that you know, once, twice, even three times. And each of those is gonna take a little bit different time to get to uh, the, the, um, the lander. And by, by identifying each of those arrivals, you can use that to figure out how far away your, your Mars quake is. Once you have the distance, you can start getting the, the velocity. Once you have the velocity, you can backtrack the, the path and start getting the, the properties of the rock that that wave traveled through. And we're able to look at on the, the right here, what the seismic velocity is as a function of depth. So we have uh, the, the surface at the top, it goes down to about 700 kilometers. And you can see that the velocity actually decreases with depth over a lot of that uh, region, the, the uh, shear wave velocity, which tells us something about the temperature and the composition as a function of depth. And so this is providing us with uh, constraints on the um, temperature variations within the mantle, uh, the compositional variations within the mantle. And again, that's informing our models of Mars's structure, which then can go back to um, models of differentiation. And finally, uh, we're getting the, the, we've gotten the size of the core. Um, we are able to do that by using those uh, well-located events in Cerberus Fosse and identifying uh, bounces late in the seismic record that bounced off the core. So by measuring uh, the, the time it takes for that, that bounce to arrive at, at InSight, knowing something about the velocity now of the mantle, we can figure out what the depth is to the core of that, that, uh, that caused that bounce to happen. And we find that the core radius, the radius of, of Mars' core is about 1,830 kilometers, which is roughly half the, the, the size of Mars, a little bit bigger than, than half the size of, of Mars. Um, and this is, this is big. I mean, we, we expected the core to be closer to 1,700 kilometers. It's not super, super big compared to what we expected, but that really has some, some strong implications for the history of Mars, because it turns out if the core is that big, the density has to be low. And, and I'll talk about the density in a minute. So the, the most direct way to get the density is by looking at the uh, motion of, of Mars's North Pole, which doesn't sound very uh, intuitive, but that turns out to be the most effective way to, to get at the density of the core of Mars. And to do that, we measure the location of the inside spacecraft, and we measure it really precisely with the deep space network. We send a, a radio wave to, to InSight, InSight uh, receives it in its radio, and then turns it around without even a break in, that, in, in, in the frequency, sends it back to Earth, and then we measure the, um, both the, the delay and the frequency uh, shift of that. And by using the techniques that have been developed over the last um, 75 years for tracking spacecraft, we can actually figure out where that lander is in space with an accuracy of better than 10 centimeters or five inches. So um, that's really as, as, as close to magic, I think, as you can get in science to, to be able to tell where something is within 10 inches, within, within four or five inches at a distance of, of 200 million kilometers. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's just an amazing measurement. Um, and since Mars is, is rotating, the, the lander is moving along with the surface of Mars. And by looking at that, that spacecraft for about an hour, we can figure out what, what the arc that it's going through and figure out what the rotation pole is of Mars. And we can track that rotation pole. Uh, and that pole actually moves with time. It's not just pointing out in space in one direction. It has motion in two different time scales. It has precession and it takes about 165,000 years for it to process once around. So we can just see a, go a little bit around that precession circle. But meanwhile, it also has another wobble on top of that called a mutation. And that wobble happens 
uh, several times per year. And there, there's uh, different wobbles. Some of them wobble, some of the, the wobbles are twice a year, some of them are three times a year, some of them are irregular. And so by measuring both that wobble and the longer term precession, we can actually see how the core affects the planet. The precession is affected by the moment of inertia, which tells you how much material is uh, concentrated near the center of the planet in the, the dense iron core. And the nutation is actually a measure of how that core sloshes around inside the planet. So when you move the solid planet around, the core doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, follow immediately. It kind of sloshes around and causes this nutation. So we have the precession uh, uh, like this, where it just kind of spins around like a top, except super, super slow. And then we have the nutation, which is due to the difference between the solid planet which is like the brown egg and the liquid planet, which is, uh, uh, or the liquid interior of the planet, which is uh, wobbling more than, than, the, than the solid egg did. So by measuring uh, this wobble of the core, we can uh, uh, actually see what the size of the core is using rise. So uh, we measure the, 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 the size of that wobble uh, and it's about 250 meters. So all of Mars is kind of, uh, wobbling back and for, forth by about 250 meters, which is not very much. Um, and by the size of that wobble, we can uh, put constraints on the size of the core, which are a little bit bigger than the seismometers of uh, 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 bounds, but still it's a completely independent measure. It gives us more confidence. And we can do the same thing. We get the density directly from that. With size, we can actually uh, determine the density, but it's an independent, it, it, um, indirect measurement. We know the size. Um, we can use our knowledge of, uh, uh, of geochemistry to figure out what the density have to, has to be. Rise is a little bit more direct, um, and it gives us the, the density of the core at 6,000 plus or minus 300 kilograms per meter cubed. And this is small, so the, the core is big. Uh, in order to, to keep the conservation of mass, you have to make it less dense. Uh, this is, has, is much less dense than iron. Iron would be more than 6,500 uh, kilograms per cubic meter. And so you have to mix something into that core uh, to make it lighter. And, and the, most, uh, the, the, the best candidate for that turns out to be sulfur. And you need about 25% sulfur in order to make it that light. But nobody really knows how to get more than about 10 or 15% sulfur into the core by the processes that, that we know. And so this is causing us to kind of go back to our drawing boards and figure out you know, what, what we're doing wrong, whether it's the, um, uh, the, the, the chemistry of the, the uh, dissolution of, of sulfur, which is not very likely because we have uh, 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 lab measurements that, that tell us something different. Um, one other thing might be that the assumptions we're making about the mantle are wrong. Maybe the mantle is, is a little bit uh, more dense than, than what we think, which would be able, which would drive uh, down the, uh, the, the, uh, the, or drive up the density of the core. So anyway, this is right now, the core of Mars is broken. Uh, Insight broke the core of Mars and the scientists are working right now hard to, to figure out how they can fix it. So remember this figure from the beginning with all those question marks, what we've done is get rid of all the question marks. Okay, so um, we, we uh, know the uh, uh, size of uh, the thickness of the crust now. We know that the core is liquid and the, it's, uh, it starts uh, at a depth of a little over 1,560 kilometers. Um, those transitions in the mantle one of, the, one of them doesn't even exist because the core is big enough that it's just kind of swallowed it up. There isn't any mantle there. The other one, we've actually been able to, to see uh, some subtle uh, uh, signals in the, in the seismic records that, uh, that uh, pin it at just over uh, 1,000 kilometers deep. And that's giving us information about the, the ratio of, of iron to magnesium in the, in, in the mantle. And so now we actually are, are gonna be able to, to rewrite the the encyclopedia of the solar system. So the next uh, edition will have all these question marks uh, taken away. Um, so that's all I have about the, the inside of Mars. Um, Insight's also given some stuff about the outside of Mars. So we do take pictures. Um, as a geophysicist, that's that's a, a little bit annoying to me because uh, 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 with apologies to Jim Bell, uh, cameras are always, always getting in the way of geophysics getting 
good data on, on all these missions because everybody loves a camera. But I was uh, magnanimous enough to put a couple of cameras on my geophysical mission. And so up there on the uh, upper left, that was the first uh, image that we took of Mars. And you can sort of see the, the, the horizon there through all the, the muck that was on the lens. Um, that's a, a wide angle camera that shows about 120 degrees of, uh, of, of uh, field of view uh, that we use to, to be able to just see uh, in one photo the entire area that we wanted to deploy our seismometer in. Uh, we put a, a cover on that camera during landing in order to um, uh, uh, protect it from all this gunk. But when we opened up the cover, there was about three quarters of that gunk was still there. It had actually gotten blasted up under the cover by the, 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 uh, the jets. But luckily for us, over the course of, uh, of the, the, the next uh, year or so, most of that stuff fell off. And this is the, the images we're getting uh, from, from now on. Um, over there on the right, you can see our calibration target, which I'm kind of proud of. It's, it shows the, um, the flags of all the, the nations that have participated in this mission. This is a very international mission. Uh, both of the major instruments were, were built in Europe uh, by consortiums of uh, European and, and US partners. Uh, this could not have been done just by the US alone. Uh, it really is an international collaboration. Those two little circular things are the send your, your name to Mars chips. If you look real carefully, you can see my name. It's kind of in the upper, upper right corner of one of those chips. Uh, if you put your name on the, uh, on, enter your name on, on, on the web in the send your name to Mars, um, oh, it must have been about uh, three or four years ago now, your name will be there. So um, thanks for listening. Uh, this, is, this is a picture we took of sunset on Mars. You can see all the pictures uh, that are posted as soon as the data hits the ground before the scientists have a chance to uh, uh, pull out the, uh, the, the Bigfoot pictures. Um, at mars.nasa.gov slash insight. And um, I can stop now for questions. Great, thank you very much, Bruce. That was a lot of fun. Um, so applause. I don't know if you can hear the in-person applause in the room. So um, I, I can't find actually. to do questions three ways. This is gonna be interesting. So questions in the room. Um, and then online, uh, you can put questions in the Q&A. There are a whole bunch here that we'll, we'll, we'll make our way through some of them. And then if you're an attendee online and you want to raise your hand and be called on to speak, we can try to do that too, just to complicate our lives some more. And um, if, you're, if you're in the room, uh, just ask for a microphone. We'll just pass it to you. Yeah, so Rick is back there with the microphone. So well, Tom's, Tom's very patient here. He's very eager to ask a question. Tom Sharp. So Bruce, I've got a question for you. You said that the core is so large that not all of the mantle transitions we expected were there. So which is cut off, the transition to the Bridgmanite structure or, or Proskite, or wh what's there? Is the transition from olivine to, to beta phase and then also to spinel or not spinel? What, tell me about the transition zone of, of Mars. It's, it's the, the Proskite transition, the, 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 the six, 600 uh, kilometer transition, is the one that's it's it's basically too deep to be in the mantle. I mean that, that at that depth you're now into core, and and so you know iron's not going to do it for you. So you know we we only have you know one of the two major transitions is is, is left. So it's and it's so the the have, one is have, just swallowed. So we should have Wadsleyite and Ringwoodite still there. Those transitions from olivine to the two high pressure polymorphs. Um, you've beta clearly gamma, mistaken me gamma. for a, for someone who you've clearly mistaken me for someone who actually knows right. uh, geochemistry. <laughs> beta spinel and, and gamma spinel. Yeah. All right, great. I don't know, Tom. I don't know if I've seen you this excited about a seminar like ever. So that's like really cool. Um, I'm going to ask a question from online here. Um, kind of an interesting basic question: Is the mechanism of these Mars quakes mostly related to thermal expansion and contraction, or do the data support? other possible processes? What's actually driving Mars quakes on Mars? Well, the, the, that, that is actually a really interesting question. And, and, and the, 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 the glib answer is it's driven by the cooling of the planet because all geology uh, on, on any planet is driven by the, 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 the cooling engine of the planet. As, as the planet cools, um, that's, you know, part of the cooling is, is done by by volcanism, you know, bringing hot material up to the surface and letting it cool off. Um, you get uh, plate tectonics is basically 
uh, a very efficient mechanism that the Earth has figured out to, to get rid of its heat. Um, as, it, uh, as it cools, it also uh, contracts, the whole planet contracts, and, and, and uh, the differential contraction puts a, a, a compression into the crust and, and causes it to break. Uh, mountains are built from, from these kinds of things. Uh, rifts are built by the, these things. So everything's driven by the heat engine of the planet. Um, but when you get down to the, the granular, uh, you know, what's causing you know, motion on this particular fault, um, that's, that's a little bit uh, more complicated question. Um, it could be due to um, uh, volcanic activity that is causing, you know, uh, vertical motions in the crust or, or, uh, or extensional motions as, as uh, magma gets pushed up into, into dikes and, and, and pulls the, the, the crust apart. It could be due to um, just the, the gravitational slumping of uh, a material that's been pushed up by uh, maybe convection in the mantle. Uh, and then uh, as it gets pushed up, it then tries to kind of slump down over that, uh, that dome and you get uh, a, a whole pattern of, 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 of cracking and, and, uh, and crustal uh, deformation. And so, and, and of course on the earth, uh, just the, the, the motions of plate tectonics is what, what, what does most of it on the earth. We believe that um, on Mars that it's, we, Mars only has one plate, there's no plate tectonics. So most of it has to do with vertical motions in, in, in the crust. Uh, superimposed on sort of the secular cooling, the, the long-term cooling of the crust. But um, as we're, we're starting to get uh, some uh, what we call source mechanism uh, measurements where we can actually see what the, uh, the motion was on false. Once we get the motion on the false that, that caused the quakes, we can figure out you know, what the stresses were that, that caused those. And we can start putting that together with the geology to, to figure out what the details of, of uh, a given fault system that, that might be active, how that works. Great, thanks. I think there's a couple of questions in the room, right? Uh, whoever has the mic, oh, Lene. Hi, yeah. Um, I'm just curious, do we know anything about the structure of the area of partial melt under the Tharsis bulge that was uh, that appeared in your um, in your graphics, or is it definitely not high re high enough resolution to look at something that small? No, the, I mean those those, those cartoons were inferences, uh, you know, based on based on the, the the volcanic activity that we see on Tharsis, and and uh, what it, what it's informed by though is the sort of the thermal structure that is necessary to cause the um, seismic uh, low velocity zone that we see, the, the, the S wave low velocity zone. So uh, that decrease in seismic velocity um, tells us something about the, the um, thermal gradients in the upper mantle and those thermal gradients uh, inform us as to where we would expect the partial melting to occur. And so uh, we don't have a direct seismic imaging. You know, this, all, all of our models are really, um, sort of radially symmetric models at, at, at best, you know, just shells of the planet. We don't have, you know, 3D, uh, the capability to do 3D models. And in fact, you know, some of the, the things we see, like the, the crustal structure, that's just really right underneath InSight. And then we have to extrapolate for the rest of the planet by using, you know, gravity or, or something else to understand how the, the thickness of the crust varies over the planet. And so, um, yeah, we, we would love to be able to, to, to image that, that, uh, that, that enormous magma chamber under Tharsis, but that's gonna take a, a different kind of mission uh, uh, sometime in the future. Great, and I think there was, a, there was another question here, somebody else? Um, hi, uh, forgive me if this is just a lack of basic chemistry knowledge, but um, why uh, is it that you guys think that sulfur is responsible for the decrease in density of the core, and if not sulfur, what kind of experiment would you do to uh, determine that? Okay, so um, my ignorance of, of, of chemistry is probably not that much less than yours, uh, but but you know, but but I've gone to lots of chemistry talks, so I, I can pretend like I know what I'm talking about. There there, there are a lot of experiments that, that look at sort of the solubility of various different elements in molten iron, for example. We know what the uh, abundance is, abundances of various different elements in carbonaceous chondrites. And you start melting things 
and you start, you know, sort of dropping uh, molten iron through, you can uh, dissolve some of those, that material into the iron. And that dissolution into the iron depends on what the, the, the pressure is, depends on what the temperature is as you're going down. And so um, when you go through the process and, and you model the whole process, it's very difficult to push that much, that much sulfur into, into the iron. It, it just, it does, that, more of that doesn't dissolve. And I think there's, there are people in the room with you right now that can probably explain that a lot better than I can. But um, you know, there, there's, there are other things that can dissolve in, in, in the iron. There, you can get carbon in there, you can get oxygen in there. Um, there. You can get a lot of elements in there, but some of them aren't very available in, in the melt. Some of them don't dissolve in very well. Um, and, and so there's been a lot of work at, in, at, in both theoretically and experimentally on, on how this might happen. And so we, we have kind of fairly, well, more or less uh, uh, wide slash narrow bounds on, on, on how these processes work. But um, when, I, when I talk to my uh, geochemist friends, they just shake their heads at, at, at 20, 25% sulfur. <laughs> All right, we have a couple of people online who asked, how did you know the location of the Mars quakes? Because you needed to know the locations, right, to do the, some of the analysis? Yeah, and, and that, that's, that's actually, actually a question that a lot of people uh, asked us for, for, you know, decades, you know, because if anybody knows anything about seismology, they know that you need at least three or four stations to be able to do seismology. And so we had to, to convince people that with one station, you could actually do the job. And the way that you do that, in, in, in so in, in short, is that you can figure out the distance by looking at the time between your P wave and, and S wave. Because the farther you go, the, the, the farther the P wave gets out in front of the S wave. So that PS time interval will tell you what the distance away that the, the quake was. So that gives you a sort of a, a circle at, at a given distance um, that the, the Mars quake must have been located at. And then what you're looking for then is something called polarization. So if you have a P wave, the thing about P waves is that they are the motion, the, the vibration of the material is vibrating in the direction that the wave is going. And so if you can actually see uh, the direction that, 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 that the ground is shaking and pull that out of all the different noises going on, you can then get the direction that the wave is coming from. Uh, in principle, you can get the, the direction and the, the angle at which it's coming up, but they, the, the sort of so-called incidence angle, but that's harder. But on some of these, we can get the direction. It's really hard to do. You have to have a pretty clean signal to do it. Um, but for those five events, we're actually able to get a good enough polarization that we could figure out the direction that it was coming from. We have the P and the S wave to figure out how far it was. And then we can then locate that, that event on the, on the surface of the planet. We can't get depth yet. That's that's uh, that's a, a, a little bit harder thing. Um, sometimes you can get depth by looking at both the direct wave and then the bounce off the surface, but um, we haven't gotten a clean enough signal to do that yet. That's really cool for a non seismologist. That was a really nice and clear explanation. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask one last question here. It's an exit question um, that Edgar Nero asked. So. Uh, after complimenting you on a nice talk, he says he asks uh, regarding the seismic sensors. If you could do it all over again, would you do anything differently? Oh yeah, would I do anything differently? I think we would pay a lot more, try to pay a lot more attention to the, the, the thermal compliance of the sensor. Um, it's pretty hard to test uh, at, at those levels on the earth. You know, if, if we had, uh, you know, magnitude four and five earthquakes or Mars quakes, we wouldn't be worrying about, about this kind of stuff, but um, the, the, the Biggest uh, noise source are these these glitches, these these you know thermal thermal pops, <coughs> and um, the micro mechanics of of actually bolting things together. I think is something that that we would spend more time. Oh, wow! We uh, your pros on is Bruce to get the. the uh, us. I can still hear you. Yeah, can, okay. you can't you froze hear me? for a second. You were saying the, the, something about the micro mechanics, and then you froze. Yeah, of, of, of bolting things together so you don't get those pops. Plus, probably uh, do a, a Wi-Fi connection to get the data back and forth. Because 
massive, and and that's uh, so again, it's a, it's a pain in the in, in, in the to pull that the effect of that out of the data. All right. Well, we're starting to have technical difficulties, but we made it through the hour, so that's a triumph. So um, <laughs> thank you, Bruce, for for uh, a great presentation. Thanks to everyone online and in the room. Thank you to uh, Rick and Kim for uh, doing some heroic technical work to make sure we things would move smoothly today. Um, thanks also to Becca and Becky for arranging for refreshments outside for those who partook of that. So we'll try to keep that going as long as the weather is good. So uh, and see you next week uh, here. Thank you.